everyone, I'm Pafua Yang. Community groups in the suburbs continue to bring attention to racial injustice. Reporter Sonia Gowen shows us what an event looked like in Brooklyn Park. Prosecute the police! No justice, no peace! Dozens of sign-waving suburbanites gathered in Central Park on Thursday. The group, made up of mostly students, want justice for George Floyd. Floyd is the black man who died while being arrested by a white Minneapolis police officer. The crowd marched and chanted their way to the community center. They took a knee and held a moment of silence to remember black people who've been killed by white police officers. I simply couldn't sit back and keep living my life knowing that such a heinous act took place in Minneapolis. Knowing they too could be George Floyd. We're dying. One in a hundred black men, their main cause of death is being killed by the police. Giving a voice to those who have been historically disenfranchised. I have a pedestal being white because I have white privilege, so I'm trying to use that to give people who have not had the opportunity to speak and be heard. The demonstrators call for an end to racial injustices in education and the criminal justice system. I'm a teacher because I want students to feel affirmed when they walk into my classroom and see somebody that looks like me. And I don't always think that that's the case as far as um, teachers go. Organizers say this is not the time for people in the suburbs to stay silent to what's going on around them. That was getting the attention. Now the world is watching us. So what are we going to do? Pull up. That's right. Pull up. Pull up for your people. Represent. Organizers say this isn't just a black issue, but it's a human rights issue. And they called on everybody to work together to make the world a better place for everyone. In Brooklyn Park, Sonia Goins, CCX News. The near food shelf in Crystal is open again after a lengthy closure due to the COVID-19 pandemic. That's the situation that, that we got ourselves into and the reason that we closed in the first place. We were concerned both about our clients, you know, getting the virus and our volunteers. Past President Larry Hansen says in the nearly three months the food shelf has been closed, they've worked to make it safe for volunteers and clients alike. Workers are wearing masks and in some cases gloves. The aisles are now one way and clients no longer come into the building to pick up their food. But aside from people not yet knowing near is open again, there's one other problem. Many of their volunteers can't come back yet because of the risk of contracting the coronavirus. We lost a lot and still uh, I don't have a full compliment from when we closed before. But uh, so we're, we're trying to fill in those gaps with, with volunteers who are willing to come and work part time. If you'd like to help out or you need food from near, give them a call. Their number and more about this story is on our website, ccxmedia.org. They are meant to be used every day. There's a butter barn, she calls it, and these forms relate to vernacular architecture. They are covered in motifs that uh, call to mind the natural world, flowers uh, that are scribed into the vessels and then um, painted with in the underglaze. We've got a number of pedestals throughout the first floor lobby gallery as well as the display cases here that flank the red opening doors and a large pedestal that's next to our JC studio and many of these are in the windows. We are open now on Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays from 10 to 6. During other hours when you're on your social distancing walks you might get a peek at her work through the windows. And there's a great variety in, in the pieces, both in form, function, size, but they all are unified by palette and by, again, those floral and natural world motifs that are drawn, essentially, on them. For now, I'm Neil Persley in Hopkins, CCX News. Hi everyone, I'm Pafua Yang. I'm in the parking lot of Wyzetta High School where an organization called We Are Wyzetta Strong is filling up a semi-truck 
with food. And I have Jason Litke here with me. He's with that organization. Jason, can you tell me more about what you guys are doing here? Yeah, you know, it just started out with uh, three dads that were over a happy hour wanting to do something good for the community. And uh, we have lots of great friends and lots of great local sponsors. And the idea really just took hold. And look at how the what a great turnout it's been so far. And we're just super appreciative of uh, uh, the local community pitching in to help IOCP as well as Frogtown in St. Paul. And how much donations have you guys already gotten? Well, we've already got five pallets on the truck. Our hope is to fill it out with 24 or 26 pallets. We've got another 12 here and another five that are coming. So we're going to be really close, but we'd love to see more people keep coming down. Where are the donations going? The donations are going to uh, IOCP down here in Plymouth and then also to Frogtown in St. Paul to help out local families. Okay, and what kind of donations are you guys looking for? We're looking for toiletries, diapers, canned foods, uh, breakfast food, Foods, toiletries, anything that can help support the local families. I think all of us are relatively fortunate around the community, but there's a lot of people in need right now and we just want to help. Can you tell me more about who's all here helping? Yeah, it's 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 a great collection of people. We've got kids that represent YZ from all classes, so freshmen all the way through graduating seniors. We've got local associations represented, local businesses, and then a lot of just parents that care a lot about helping the local community. The Stack the Semi effort on Thursday was successful too. Volunteers stacked not one, but two semi-trailers with 44 pallets full of donated food. If you would still like to donate food or money toward this effort, organizers ask that you make a donation on your own to Interfaith Outreach in Plymouth. We've got more information on this story and others on our website, ccxmedia.org. Have a good weekend. Find more local news stories at ccxmedia.org and follow us on social media. He's been a fixture in the school and on the fields at Park Center High School for a long time. As Jay Wilcox reports, longtime Pirates coach and teacher Terry Westerman is retiring. A long career as a teacher and coach at Park Center didn't end the way Terry Westerman expected it to. The COVID-19 outbreak meant he wouldn't coach one final track season this spring. It's been extremely different, even through trying to get kids on the internet and talk to them and send them workouts and send them words of encouragement. And, you know, we had a little start, so we just got a little sampling for track. We had that first week where we got a chance to kind of just get things kind of going and then the the wheels kind of come off and then all of a sudden I think the major thing is you got to figure out just like in everything in life you got to figure out there's always something more important and there's something more important than sport there's more important than hanging out together it's called our health Westerman is perhaps best known for his time as Pirates head football coach from 1997 to 2006 he was an assistant before that but he also coached track boys and girls hockey a little soccer, and help start the adapted sports program. And his history with the school goes back to the mid-70s. I went to school here. I met my wife here. Uh, two of my children met their wives here. Uh, lived just down the road and all the friendships and, you know, standing out here the night we did the Be the Light thing, it was surreal. We didn't have a home. And people might not understand that, but we didn't have a home for 30 years at this school. We were up at Osseo's Field. So we never, we never, and that was our goal as players to just one time, one time play a game here. Terry coached and taught for an even 40 years. X's and O's and wins and losses aren't what he's all about. Coaching his athletes to succeed in life is more important. And when he sees them later, that's what he'll ask about. Are you a good husband? Do you contribute to your society? Do you contribute to your neighborhood? Are you honorable to your wife? Do you, are you a figure for your kids to look up to? If you do that, what does that scoreboard have to do with anything? Jay Wilcox, CCX Sports. Terry Tuma joins us again this summer with his weekly fishing tips. Here's Terry to talk about casting crankbaits. Had many, many questions recently about crankbaits, casting crankbaits that is. And yes, it's a big, big factor, but you know, a really a good approach is just not to cast and retrieve, cast and wind, cast and wind. Vary your retrieves, bump it off wood, rip it off some weeds, uh, hit rocks, 
But you know, the biggest factor here is, you know, we just take a crankbait as a crankbait. It is not. But we have to really understand what a crankbait is, the wobble, the color, and of course the lip design. So a great way to start with crankbaits, especially with bass fishing, is start out with a shallower runner and then drop it to a medium runner and then to a deep diver. And what this does is you're straining the water column until you have fish contact. However, we're not talking in foot increments, we're talking in inch increments, maybe six or eight inches. And then keep dropping it down, dropping it down, dropping it down, again, until you have fish contact. And when we're talking wobble, we're talking the vibration factor. So that's gonna be profile. And then, you know, color is the third ingredient. Color is a big, big plus for us to understand. And a good starting point is match the hatch. If you don't have uh, any results with matching the hatch, then try a different color. But also too, say you got a, a, you're matching the hatch, but you need to do something you, uh, different. You, well, you know, this is not too bad, but then consider maybe getting a crankbait that's got a chartreuse stripe or a red stripe or a yellow stripe. That little tiny difference can make a big, big plus in catching fish and not catching fish. And then when you cast out, and it, just before it hits the water, start to crank your reel so it's, it's going to start to vibrate as soon as it enters that water column. Give it a try, work with your crankbait, trust those crankbaits, you're gonna catch bass and also walleyes when you're casting. For more local sports and news stories from the Northwest suburbs, please visit our website at ccxmedia.org. That's all for sports, I'm John Jacobson.